Hi there, I'm Christine, and this is the Freedom Update, the bi-weekly video podcast from the Canadian Constitution Foundation, where we tell you about our ongoing cases, give you updates about interesting constitutional developments from across Canada, and give you information about how you can join us for our upcoming events. Thanks for tuning in, and let's talk about freedom. We have some really exciting news about one of our cases, and the update is we won. We won our case against the Trudeau government's election censorship law. This fall, we were in court challenging a federal law, Section 91 Sub 1 of the Canada Elections Act. That law makes it an offense to publish certain types of false statements about political candidates and other public figures during an election period. Now, this might sound like a good idea. I mean, none of us like fake news, but should it really be up to the government to decide what fake news is? And keep in mind, this law applies to individuals, not just to media outlets. The law is also vague, and it gives a huge amount of discretion to government bureaucrats. It prohibits certain types of false statements about a candidate's education, about their professional credentials, their place of birth, associated groups, and criminal records and investigations. But the law doesn't define what a false statement is. But if an unelected bureaucrat decides that you've made one, you can get a fine of up to $50,000 and be sentenced to up to five years in jail. This even applies to so-called false statements about non-candidates. The law covers public figures, like individuals associated with a political party or candidate. But again, it doesn't provide a definition. Could a campaign manager qualify? A pundit? A union leader? None of this is clear. And there are no carve-outs or exemptions, like for comedy or sarcasm. A joke on Twitter could land you under investigation. And it doesn't even matter if you believed that the statement was true when you posted it. There's no room for error in this law. So posting about, for example, Andrew Scheer being an insurance broker or Justin Trudeau being a crook could violate the law. It's up to the discretion of those elections officials. Now, while false information is a problem, it's long been a familiar and unfortunate feature of election campaigns. But even if Canada's democracy would be better without false information, it would be worse with the government serving as editor-in-chief. With vague language and a lack of definitions, without any room for error or a knowledge requirement that the individual posting false information know that the information is false, the legislation gives the Elections Commissioner broad and unpredictable discretion about how the law will be interpreted and enforced. And as the arbiter of truth, will the government act in a fair and impartial way? We didn't want to find out. And that's why we challenged the law. We argued that the law is a violation of our right to freedom of expression. And it turns out that the Ontario court agreed. They struck down the law with particular focus on the lack of the law's requirement for the individual having knowledge that the statement be false. Our Charter of Rights and Freedoms protects the right to freedom of expression, and it's content neutral. It protects statements that are false, it protects statements that are true, it protects statements that are popular and statements that are unpopular. Voters are entitled to decide for themselves which sources of information about candidates are credible and which are not. That isn't the role of government. The response to false information should not be for the government to censor speech, but to promote media and information literacy among the population and foster an open discourse so Canadians can make up their own minds about who to vote for. We are really thrilled with this result, but of course, the government could always appeal. For updates on what happens, be sure to continue watching this video podcast and you can also subscribe to our mailing list at theccf.ca. There are some interesting constitutional developments from across Canada, and this week we're looking at some of the problems with the rollouts of the federal government's quarantine hotel policy. The quarantine hotels are now operating for travelers travelers who are entering Canada, and I have some really serious concerns about how they're operating. We're currently preparing a constitutional challenge of these facilities, and I'll have more to share on that in the coming days. 
But for now, let's look at what's actually happening in some of these facilities. Travelers into Canada are now required to take a COVID test before they can board their flight. They need to take a second test once they land in Canada, and they need to quarantine at a government approved hotel while they await the results of that second test, which can take up to three days. Travelers must pay for the tests and for the quarantine. Now, the rollout of this policy has been rocky to say the least. Many travelers have been unable to get through uh, to the government phone lines to even book their quarantine stays. Some have waited six to 10 hours on hold before their calls have just been dropped. And once they are able to book a hotel, many have been complaining about price gouging. For example, one family of three was assigned a quarantine hotel after being unable to book one through the government phone line. The hotel cost them nearly $4,000 for three nights, even though their test results were received within a few hours. Other travelers have complained about unsafe conditions in these hotels. A woman was sexually assaulted at a Montreal quarantine hotel, which had also removed the deadbolts from the hotel room doors. In other hotels, rooms weren't ready and incoming travelers were cor corralled together in large banquet halls, creating numerous contact, COVID contact points, making these travelers less safe than they would have been if they'd just driven home and quarantined at their own house. And then there's the food. The cost of food is supposed to be included in the hotel stay, but travelers have complained about waiting hours for food that's cold and inedible in some cases. All of this is designed to stop COVID variants from entering Canada, but the reality is that the variant is already here and the policy is exposing travelers to more risk and also violating some of their fundamental rights. Travelers are being mistreated and while this policy was designed to keep Canadians safe, it appears to be exposing them to even more unnecessary risk. Quarantine hotels aren't supposed to be a punishment for travelers, but that's how they appear to be operating. Now travel isn't prohibited and many individuals have good reasons for traveling. People need to travel for work, for medical care outside of Canada, to reunite with family or to assist sick loved ones who are overseas. These aren't people who should be punished and our constitution protects the rights of these people. Yeah, even in a pandemic. It's very strange that the government has created exemptions for some travelers for compassionate reasons, but not for others. For example, if you need to uh, enter Canada to assist a sick loved one who resides in Canada, you can apply for a compassionate exemption. But if you're in Canada and you need to leave to assist a sick loved one in another country, you're not eligible for the same type of compassionate relief. Why? It doesn't make sense to accommodate people in one situation, but not in the other equally likely situation. In my view, the government should end this policy altogether, but at a minimum, they need to change the policy to allow more exemptions from these facilities. They also need to ensure that the hotels carrying out government policies are, are run in, in a humane way. Right now, they aren't. Stay tuned for more information about the status of the challenge that we're planning. Uh, you can learn more by continuing to watch this video update or by signing up for our mailing list at the ccf.ca. We have an exciting event coming up this month with our friends at the Runnymede Society. It's our annual Law and Freedom Conference, and it's going to be held virtually on March 12th and 13th. We're thrilled that we're going to be joined by Justice Malcolm Rowe of the Supreme Court. You can reg register at runningmeatsociety.ca and if you put in the promo code FLASH, you'll get 25% off your ticket. That's all for this update. Thanks for tuning in and let's keep fighting for freedom in Canada.